Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Sophie Tai and I'll be running today's webinar, Unlocking Value for Geotex in Leapfrog Geo. I recently joined Sequence Asia Pacific team in Perth as an engineering geologist. My background is both in the civil industry and the mining industry, predominantly in gold and base metals. So to begin today, I will introduce Sequent as a company and then go into a bit more about how Leapfrog can and is being used in the geotechnical engineering space. Then we'll move into a demonstration of the software to show some useful features and workflows so you can see how our products can and are being used to support geotechs in the mining industry. This presentation will be quite high level and isn't an in-depth demonstration of specific how-tos within the software. For training in the software or for assistance with your products, please contact your local Leapfrog office. So Leapfrog, the software application most people are familiar with already, is the package where the visualization and the modeling is completed. This includes both Leapfrog Geo, our implicit modeling software for geological modeling, and Edge, an additional module which unlocks the estimation functionality. However, Leapfrog is just one component within the greater sequence solution. This slide illustrates how the sequence suite of products establish and sustain a continuous flow of communication that benefits the entirety of your organizations and even groups beyond that who ultimately impact the decision-making process. So at the top of this figure, we have VIEW. VIEW is a free collaboration tool ingrained within Leapfrog that allows users to visualize, discuss, and share 3D models. For example, on the decision-making level, there are a multitude of impacting factors that leads to a final decision. To be heard and considered, the information needs to be communicated quickly, clearly, and as intuitively as possible, and often to people outside the organisation as well. This is where VIEW shines. Moving down to the centre of this figure, we have Central. Internally, when stepping into the more technical realm, the data volume that needs to be shared and understood is much larger. Therefore, a different system, i.e. central, can be accessed for collaboration and allows not only for the visualization of modeling data, but also its safekeeping and organization, facilitating the audibility of the company. Towards the end of today's webinar, we will take a brief look at the value that central provides and how more and more geotechs are using it, particularly for its auditability function, as well as for accessing geological models as a starting point for geotechnical models. Then on the high technical end at the bottom of this figure sits the modeling software, which is directly connected to Central and all geoscience information used in the modeling process. By having instant access to the latest information, both about data as well as intelligence exchange, the communication cycle is complete. The geotechnical model is widely considered to be the cornerstone of any underground or open pit mining geotechnical design. It provides the basis for developing geotechnical domains and analyses inputs, meaning it is directly linked to the confidence and reliability of your design. A geotechnical model combines and considers all geotechnical data which includes geological, structural, hydrogeological, and geomechanical data to create a powerful tool that can be used to inform a myriad of geotechnical considerations regarding all stages of both open pit and underground mining operations. Essentially, the geotechnical model forms the basis of decisions surrounding, and these are not limited to, pit geometry, slope and batter angles, mining method, and equipment selection. It also plays a factor in virtually all other strategic planning decisions. So, with this in mind, here are some of the major benefits our geotechnical users are experiencing when using Leapfrog Geo for getting this job done. One of the major benefits is the ability to have all your geotechnical data in one place. This includes your geotech logs, drill holes, RQD data, pit wall or window mapping, lab testing, photogrammetry, ETC. Um, and not only is it easy to import this data, having it all in Leapfrog makes visualization and analysis straightforward. 
Being able to integrate multidisciplinary data sets is also a huge advantage as it removes the need to have related relevant data spread across multiple packages. And this ensures all data is considered and that it is considered holistically when undertaking modeling and analysis. No data gets left out. Finally, the rapid 3D modeling functionality is a game changer. Leapfrog uses the RBF interpolant to quickly generate surfaces, which means you can run and rerun multiple iterations, and when you add new data, the model is updated quickly. Data sources. So geotechnical data can be collected from a plethora of sources in many different formats. In terms of Leapfrog, the most relevant data source is going to be structural data and rock mass classification data. Some of the more common sources of this data are photogrammetry, core logging, underground mapping, pit wall mapping, bench crest inspections, field scanning. Um, and this data can all be applied directly to your leapfrog models to implicitly generate surfaces and then dynamically update these as new data is added. In the geotech space, there is also other data and work going on across a range of other areas or other software packages. Um, these could include things like lab testing results, seismic data, slope stability models, stress models. So any parameter that has an x, y or z value, well sorry, an x, y and <laughs> z value, um, can be brought into Leapfrog and viewed as point data or coded points. And this gives you a platform to view all the relevant data in one place alongside all the other relevant data. Uh, okay, leapfrog for geotechs. So um, today we'll be covering some of the basic functionality in leapfrog um, used to create a geotechnical model and we'll go through a workflow for creating a geotech model in leapfrog. Um, the fundamental idea of making a geotech model is similar to that of creating a geological model and that is getting your domaining correct. Uh, so today's workflow will look something like this. Firstly, we'll use um, existing structural and geological models as the starting point for domaining. Then we will look at using some of the cool statistical tools in Leapfrog to see if these domains require further subdomaining. We will then look at creating a numeric model within these domains to create uh, to, to estimate RQD. And then finally, we will look at some outputs that could be used for geotechnical design. Finally, this slide outlines what we'll be covering in our demonstration. Um, so we'll begin by importing and using some tools to view drill hole data. Then we will look at a couple of ways to generate fault surfaces and some fault domains. And then we'll go on to view and analyze our structural data and use a couple of cool tools to demonstrate how you can further subdomain your geotechnical domains. Um, we'll look at generating a simple geotechnical domain model and finally we'll look at creating a numeric model based on RQD data. So let's jump into it. To start with I'm just going to quickly run through the Leapfrog Geo main window uh, just for those of you who might not have seen it before. So at the top left corner we have the menu and this is where we can open projects, create new projects, um, save a copy and have a play around with our settings. Um, along the top we have the toolbar and you'll see me using some of these buttons throughout today's webinar. In the left hand panel here we have the project tree which has a top level list of standard folders and objects. The project tree is where you import your data and where you work with your data. The processing panel is at the top here on the right of the Leapfrog Geo main menu button and it's opened by clicking on the button to the right of it. The button is inactive when there are no tasks running and it's green when tasks are running. In the centre of our screen we have the scene view which is where objects appear um, when they're added from the project tree. To add an object to the project tree we just select then drag and drop. The shapes list below the scene view lists all of the objects that are active or visible in the scene window. Uh, and finally, down in the bottom left corner we have the status bar. 
the coordinates that appear in the status bar there uh, show the location of the mouse cursor when it is over an object in the scene window. Um, so for today's webinar, we're just going to say that we've been given this geology model by the geology team. Right, so we'll just move on to um, importing and varying our drill hole data, I think. So I'm just going to bring in the drill holes that have been logged for lithology. Cool. So um, here's our legend up here and we can see um, what lithologies have been used to generate the geological model. Um, so we can see that we have recent in blue sitting uh, in the top of the drill holes, uh, day site in purple. Um, early diorite in yellow and basement um, in green. Um, there's also a fault code here in red which is where the geologists have logged fault zones. Um, and there's a few ways you can sort of display and um, visualize your data uh, in the scene. So I'm just going to uh, display the geology model again that's been generated from uh, or using this drill hole data. So we can see that there is a thin layer of cover at the top which has um, been logged as recent. Um, and then underneath that we have our basement and day site. Um, and that's been intruded by our early diorite. Um, we also have two faults uh, that have been defined using the fault logging. we can see just in there. Cool, so that's kind of how we view it and um, look at our data, our drill hole data. Um, now we're going to look at faults. So there's two common methods for delineating uh, fault zones um, and we will be using our IQD data to do this today. So if we just bring in our, oh wrong one, um, sorry. <laughs> bring in our RQD data. Cool. Um, so here you can see the RQD logging uh, with the reds and oranges indicating areas of low RQD and the blues and greens indicating areas of high RQD. Um, so once again another way of viewing it and there's also um, the option to add a value filter um, down in the bottom right cor in corner in the properties panel. Um, so you might want to do this if you want to highlight, say, your lower values. Uh, you can also create your own uh, color maps down here um, in the shapes list. Cool, so I'm just going to bring in um, the crown fault. Cool, so here we can see uh, this fault plane that uh, the geos have mapped um, and we can see when we overlay it onto the drilling it kind of um, well, it coincides with the lower RQD areas um, so you can see the faults aligning with that RQD data. Cool so the first way we're going to model a fault or a damaged domain um, is by using distance buffers. So we're going to create distance buffers um, around this fault plane here. Um, and this is really beneficial when you want to get an idea of what the distribution of the RQD is at different intervals away from the fault. Cool, okay, oh, a bit of a delay. Okay, so now we're looking at our RQD drilling still um, and a distance buffer that's created that's been created around that blue fault plane. Um, and if I just take a slice perpendicular through here, oh it's a bit of a delay. Um, we can see our fault plane here at the center, this blue one. And then each of the distance buffers that have been created are at 10 meter intervals um, moving away from that fault plane. So once we've created these distance buffers, it's possible to back flag the distance buffer model onto the drilling and use that to have a look at some statistics. 
Uh, this is extremely useful as it allows you to see what the RQD is doing in each buffer zone. So I'm just going to right click on my merged table, uh, select statistics and I'm going to go with a table of statistics. Cool. So uh, here we can see some basic stats for our RQD values within those distance buffers we made around our fault plane. So count uh, is the total number of individual samples uh, in each envelope, or each distance buffer. Length uh, is the total number of samples, sorry, the total, the total, okay, length is the total length of samples. Um, and mean is the mean RQD. Uh, so we can see that the RQD, uh, or the mean RQD within 10 meters of the fault is around 45, 46. Um, at 20 meters, it's about the same, um, and so on. And then we come to 50 meters um, away from our fault, and the RQD jumps from about 55 up to 70. So from this, we can infer that the fault zone has a zone of influence of about 45 or 50 meters uh, from the crown fault, fault plane. Cool. Uh, so. What we'll do now is take a look at the second method of defining a fault zone. So we've looked at distance buffers and this time we're going to use the interval select tool. Um, so if I just remove these buffers, um, you can see that we've now got the RQ drilling, RQD drilling and the fault plane. And if I just um, pan through this in section view, we can see that there are areas um, of the fault plane that uh, don't necessarily honor or um, reflect um, the RQD data that we're looking at. Um, so I guess the fault plane is like a lot smaller uh, in width than we would expect um, a fault zone or a fault domain to be based on this area um, of low RQD values. So for the next option, we'll, uh, we're going to use the interval select tool to model our fault domain um, by selecting areas of low RQD that we believe are associated with the fault. Um, so using the inter interval select tool um, is really, really beneficial when you want to accurately delineate zones that vary in width. Um, and we know this is generally the case for faults that are almost never uniform planar structures, they're anastomos, they can be discontinuous, they might have localised zones of wider or thicker or thinner um, shearing or brecciation. Um, so yeah, so what we'll do is um, we will go into RQD here and uh, select a new interval selection. Um, just call that fault. Um, and then what we'll do is, ooh, still thinking. We'll just go through here and um, select the areas of low RQD. Um, that we believe are associated with our fault. Um, so we'll just keep pinning through until we've got them all. I mean, that could be as well, maybe. Down in here. Cool. And, um, yeah, so what we'd do is we'd, we'd um, step through the whole model like this, selecting the areas um, that we'd like to um, represent our fault zone. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll just assign these to a new fault. Um, okay, and then um, we would save that. So you would uh, you would go through and do this through your model, um, selecting all of the intervals that you want to be included in your fault domain. Cool. So. Um, now I'm just going to create um, a new model that's going to be comprised of these fault domains. So to create a new model, let's go new geological model. Mm, be fault selection. Change my service resolution. 
and close out AQD. Um, So I've just brought in this um, output volume here. So we can see how the model's been set up. Um, this is the output volume, and this indicates what the extent of the model will be. And then when we go on to build our model, we'll create surfaces that we will then activate as volumes, and these volumes will be generated by being essentially cut out of the shape. Um, so this will result in a collection of closed message, uh, meshes um, or airtight volumes. So we're going to use the vein modeling tool for the fault we've just selected um, those intervals for. And I've actually gone through and selected those intervals um, prior during this webinar, just because it would have taken too long to do live. So just, but just so you get the idea. Um, so we'll go into surface chronology, uh, new vein from base lithology. Uh, yep, crown fault, crown fault, okay. Cool. So the, the vein modeling tool is useful when you want to model two sets of contact points above and below the unit that you're modeling. Um, so it will create a hanging wall set and a foot wall set of contact points. Um, cool. So that's done. So we can see how quickly, um, how quick it is to create a new volume that represents this fault domain, um, which encompasses the intervals that we selected or that I selected earlier. So now we have a more accurate volume representing um, our fault domain. Uh, so it's possible to back flag this version of the model onto the RQD drilling. Um, and this is useful because it enables you to review your RQD data against this newly generated volume. So to do this, I'll just open another table of statistics. Statistics. I'm going to go for a table of statistics again. Cool, so here we can see our lithologies and the crown fault we just modelled um, against the mean, their mean RQD values. So we can see the mean RQD for crown faults is about 46, um, which is a lot, lot lower than the, uh, the other surrounding lithologies. Uh, so moving on to importing and viewing structural data. So in addition to the uh, geology and RQD we've looked at so far, this data set also has five holes that have been logged for uh, Q parameters. So I've just brought those in there. Um, so structural measurements are shown as disks in LeapFrog. Um, for each of these structural disks we have a dip, dip azimuth, uh, joint alteration, uh, and joint roughness measurement. Um, these measurements are obviously from our drill holes, but it's just as easy to bring in field mapping data or structural measurements um, that have been taken from pit wall mapping or window mapping. So we're going to have a look at this data on a stereo net to start with. Um, LeapFrog has a built-in stereo net which is a really handy visual tool and of course there's a benefit of it being in the same piece of software as your model and all your other data so no need to nip back and forth or do data entry um, in another piece of software. So stereo nets are um, in the structural modeling folder uh, in the project tree um, and what we're looking at um, here are the structural measurements from those five geotech holes um, that we could easily bring in our field mapping data in the same way. Cool, so in the stereo net window we have the option to um, add additional data up here. Um, we can look at our other Bingham or Fisher statistics, we can export the stereo net as a PDF. Um, and under options, we can select um, between an equatorial or polar stereo net type, um, equal area or equal angle uh, projection, um, and then you know we can play around with the spacing of the axes and, and the labels. Um, okay, so over here we have the properties panel, um, so we can choose to display our structural measurements as poles to planes, um, or we can have the planes if we want. Here we are. Oh, there's a delay. 
Um, and we could even have um, our default contours. Cool, so um, we're going to go through the process of defining our own joint sets today. Um, I'm just going to call it Uh, cool. So you'll note how this the color of the stereo net changes. Um, here we go. And I'm just gonna click around here and select all of the measurements that um, I believe to uh, be the same joint set and um, assign them to a new joint set. Um, I'll call that joint set one. Uh, so if I just um, undock this stereo net window and show you what we've got going on um, in the scene view at the same time, um, we can see that the uh, joints are attributed as JS1, um, which are now read in the stereo net, are also read in the scene view. So it's um, totally interactive. Um, so if I just continue now uh, for the second joint set, you can see how these ones are getting selected in the scene view. I'll call that JS2. Cool. So um, you would repeat this until you have all of your joint sets defined. Uh, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 plus um, the other ones assigned to random. Um, I'm going to just flick over to one I did before. Um, I'll just discard the um, and here's the one I prepared earlier. So you can see I've got five joint sets and I've just assigned the remaining ones to a category called, category called random for now. Um, so there's a few additional visual tools such as showing um, the average um, plane of each, groups of, the of each group of measurements. Um, and it's also possible to view the stereo net in 3D. Uh, so we can either hit view here or go back to um, our scene view, where's our structural measurements, here they are. Um, and I'm just going to bring my steering net into the scene view. Cool. Yeah, so this is just a really awesome tool for visualizing your data on the steering net and um, in situ or in space at the same time. Um, so earlier I said that lithology is often a starting point for geotech domains or the, lithologi or the lithological or geological model is um, a starting point for the geotechnical domain model. Um, so yeah, because it's reasonable to assume that different rock types or different lithologies have different properties. So what we're going to do now is evaluate the geological model onto the structural measurements in those drill holes. Um, and this is useful as it allows you to see what lithology the structural measurement was taken in. Um, so we'll just go back to our 2D stereo net and have a look at um, what joint sets have occurred um, in which lithology. Cool, so joint set one, which was down here, um, appears to have occurred in the early dye at the day site and the basement. Joint set two here is predominantly in the day site Joint set 3 is pretty much only in the early diorite. Um, joint set 4 is only in the basement. And um, joint set 5 is yeah, predominantly in the diorite again, if you're the day set measurements, it looks like as well. Cool. Um, so we can go one step further by, a query, uh, by applying query filters. So, for example, if I turn on this query filter for uh, basement, Um, we can see that there are two joint sets in the basement, joint set 1 and joint set 4 and then there's remaining random sort of scattered around. Um, and then for the day site, we can see uh, we've got three joint sets, uh, 1, 2 and I think it's 5 that one there. Cool, so now that we've started quantifying uh, this we can move on to start um, to quantify a JN value based on the available data. Let's close that and get the same. So we're going to move on to subdomaining now. Um, and this section is really helpful for when you are evaluating if you should 
um, further divide up existing domains um, into subdomains to reflect your data. So, so far we've domained out the fault zone and we've got the lithology domains from the, ge from the geological model. Um, and now we're going to see if there are multiple domains within these lithologies or if further domaining within the lithologies is required. Um, and to do this, we'll be using a combination of what we found earlier in our stereo nets and um, some statistical views. Sorry, some statistical tools. I, I think I said views. I think I said views. I should have said statistical tools. Cool. So, um, let's bring in this one here. Um, what model? Um, transparent. Okay. Cool. So we can. Um, what we're going to do is look at how the three lithologies: um, basement. Day site and early diorite vary across uh, the three, one, two, three fault blocks. Um, this could also be applied to weathering profiles or any type of spatial variability that might exist within the model. So if we look at the um, combined model, um, we can see it's our three fault blocks and um, our lithology model uh, with a basement, day site, and diorite. Um, and we can see that it has split each of the three lithologies across each of the three fault blocks. So we've got nine um, lithologies now. Oh, lithologies in inverted commons. So we've got um, the basement occurring in the central fault block, and the eastern fault block, and the western fault block, um, and the same for the other two lithologies as well. Okay, so once this combined model has been evaluated onto the drilling, it's possible to look at some statistics, which is what we'll do now. Um, so we'll just go into here, um, statistics, and then I'm going to go box plot. Okay, cool. Um, so we'll start by looking at uh, the JR and the um, day site. Cool. So it looks pretty consistent across the three fault blocks. JR is spread from uh, two to three with a fairly consistent mean. Um, we can toggle to uh, the other parameters as well, e.g. Uh, joint alteration, and see that it also looks pretty similar across the three blocks. Um, so if we take a look now at the early diorite, um, change it back to joint roughness, um, we can see that the joint roughness is quite a bit lower through the central uh, fault block in the early diorite. Um, and then if we have a look at uh, joint alteration, it's a bit higher. So um, putting all of this aside, if we think logically, this kind of makes sense, you know, without considering the data. Um, if we think about it, the central fault block has gone under, has undergone two fault or deformation events. So it makes total sense that the alteration could be a bit higher and the roughness a bit lower. Um, however, now we have data that infers this. Um, which indicates that some subdomaining might be required. Cool. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly show you another statistical tool used uh, to assess the need for further subdomaining. Um, so in the box and whisker plot before, we saw the variability in joint alteration and joint roughness across the fault blocks, um, and that indicated that indicated that maybe um, the central early diorite should be split out into its own domain. So the second statistical tool I now want to show you is um, for it's, it's called the univariate statistics, and we'll use it to assess the subdomaining. Um, so we'll use this on the RQD to look at the early diorite across those three fault blocks again. Um, so here, this is the early diorite as per the geology model. Um, and it's been broken down across uh, the three fault blocks as well. So here it is in the east um, and west fault block. And um, here it is occurring in the central fault block. Cool. Uh, so 
Okay, cool. So, um, in this histogram, we can see there's an overall bimodal distribution indicating uh, two groups. One, oh, one, uh, two. However, if I turn a query filter on, and that's, so that's for all of the diorite, um, but if I turn a query filter on for just the uh, east and west, or um, just the central, um, we can see that there's a much cleaner single population uh, represented in the data. So um, this is another way of indicating that the central fault block of diorite should be its own independent domain. Cool, so where are we at now? Okay, so we've finalized our geotechnical domains. We've separated out our fault zones or damage zones. We've separate, separated out the central early diorite from the east and the west blocks of early diorite. Now we can create, create an overall domain model. So in our overall domain model, we have uh, the basement here in green. We have the day site in purple, we've got our two faults, um, the crown fault in blue and, um, sorry, the maple fault in blue and the crown fault in, sorry, the crown fault in blue and the maple fault in purple. Um, and then we've also got our uh, central die right here in orange. Uh, so now we have these areas and domains, what we can do is create um, a numeric model and use these domain boundaries for our numeric model. Um, so we'll be creating numeric models inside of these domains. Okay, so moving on to numeric models. Um, numeric models are a great way to visualize um, any of your numeric data in your data set, such as assay data, or in the geotech world for us, um, today we'll be using RQD again. Um, so this is what we'll be using today to build our numeric model. Um, so we're gonna look at two um, RQD models. We're gonna look at an overall RQD model, so that's a model for the overall geotechnical model, and then a subdomain RQD model, and then we'll compare the two. So to create a numeric model in LeapFrog, we use what is called the RBF uh, interpolant, um, or the radial base function, and this is just um, essentially the algorithm behind the interpolant. Cool, so our values are going to be our RQD, um, I'll just keep that like that for now, um, and then we'll just run our model. You can see it's running up here now. Um, so yeah, so it's just generating a first pass, first pass, sorry, RQD model. Um, and cool, so that's done. So we'll just bring that in. Um, and we can see here that we've got um, four contours, um, which are just the defaults, these values in here. However, uh, we can, or you can customize these to match whatever intervals that you want. Um, so if we look at the lowest bracket, uh, which is here, um, we can see there's kind of like a planar feature um, coming through here, through our lowest RQD. And if we bring in our um, crown fault, lo and behold, um, we can see that it generally has the same orientation. So, um, I mean, that took like 20 seconds. Um, so, obviously not the most accurate, but just for the sake of um, today's webinar, we can see that numeric models um, can be really useful to help identify fault zones or identify areas of low RQD or confirm areas of low or high RQD. Um, and it's also really quick. Uh, so to go one step further, um, instead of generating in a, a numeric model for the or on the um, entire data set, it's possible to create a domain numeric model based on those geotechnical domains we defined earlier. Um, these take a bit longer to run, obviously, so here's one I prepared earlier. Cool. Um, so here I've created a numeric 
model uh, based on those domains we defined earlier. So separating separating out the fault zones um, and separating out the central early diorite. And we can see in here there's two planar features um, coloured um, in those warm colours of low RQD um, along the fault zones. Um, uh, what else? Cool, yeah, and so we've got grade shells um, down here that um, I defined when I was making this, but you can set them up um, however you like. Uh, and we can just have a look through it as well. Um, step through the model like that. Cool. Um, so just for interest's sake now, I'll show you a comparison of the two models. Cool. Um, so this is the uh, overall domain model and the domain model. So the first pass one, the first pass one that I made, and um, the domain one that I just showed you. So the solid, um, slightly transparent color in the background is the domain model, and the outlines here um, are the non-domain model. And you can see if we move through them, um, there's quite a bit of difference. Like you can see here, the um, first pass one's kind of picking these up, um, not so much. Um, so by these I mean the low RQD values associated with that fault, um, but not so much the other fault in this area here. It's just a bit more blobby um, and not quite as accurate. Um, and this is just due to the estimation process and um, I guess it just highlights the need to subdomain in order to have um, a tighter model or you know a more appropriate level of resolution for things like your detailed design so yeah it's just um, it's less blobby and a bit more accurate um, so just we have time so I'm just going to show you a couple more cool things um, so it's possible to display your numeric data um, so our RQD data or our RQD model onto meshes um, once the domains are set up, we just evaluate them straight onto a mesh. Um, and this is a really cool tool for visualizing your data in context and space. Um, so I'm just going to bring in my meshes, uh, my stop, and my level development. Um, and you can see the level development has got the RQD um, evaluated onto it, and I've just done the same for the stop here. So yeah, we can display the RQD uh, numeric model onto these meshes, um, and that allows us to see, you know, what kind of RQD values uh, we would expect to see in specific areas. Um, and you can see in this development here, there's kind of an area of low RQD through here. So I just wonder. Look at that. There you go. So that um, aligns well with our fault. Cool. Um, so just one, one last thing um, before we run out of time. We can also evaluate our numeric model onto a block model. Where's our block model? Cool. Cool. So there's the block model uh, that we've made. Um, and what we can do is display the numeric model on here. Cool. Um, so that's just what we saw before, the numeric model that we saw before. However, now it's been evaluated onto a block model. So we can go through and click on any block and it will tell us what the RQD is um, in the domain model um, for that particular block. Uh, so we can also create a query filters um, and I've created one for our development that we looked at before. There it is there. Um, and once again you can see that sort of area of low RQD coming through here which is um, associated with our fault. Um, so yeah, so there's just a really uh, cool visualization tool um, that we can use to view our numeric uh, data from our numeric model um, in context or in space. 
Um, so just jumping back into this presentation now, I'd just like to quickly highlight some of the benefits of Leapfrog Edge in the geotechnical space. So Leapfrog Edge is an estimation, domaining and geostatistical module available within Leapfrog. And yes, that's an acronym. Um, when Edge is used together with Leapfrog Geo, the solution marries robust understanding of the domaining with advanced numeric estimates. Edge provides users with additional options for calculating numeric values within your domains, including inverse distance, nearest neighbour and ordinary Kriging. Um, and additional functionality for unlocking a better understanding of your geotechnical domains includes histogram, histograms, boundary analysis and swath plots. Just coming back to Central. Um, so Central is our data management platform that allows you to visualize, track and manage your 3D geological data from a centralized auditable environment. Central enables not only the benefit of visualization of modeling data, model management and collaboration, but also the safekeeping and organization facilitating the auditability of the company. So once a central project has been established, Geotex can reference or access the geological and structural model models already generated by the geology team. And this allows kind of individual departments to focus on their areas of expertise. With the introduction of Data Room, the need to transfer relevant shapes or data between departments is also eliminated. So when one reference shape is updated, all models referencing referencing that shape will automatically be notified and will be given the option of refreshing to the updated shape. This ensures that everyone is always using the most up-to-date information to inform their decisions. Data Room also allows any file type to be uploaded. So this increases and ensures the auditability and traceability of all components of the project. Files can be directly tied to a project and revision of files such as drilling databases, stress models, design notes, etc. can all be stored in one central place. And this is a huge benefit in terms of not only efficiency, but also record keeping and the auditability. And there's an event log, provides a record of every action taken throughout the life of the project, um, including what the action was, who it was made by, and when it was made. To summarise, Leapfrog Geo has a great, easy to use interface for importing and viewing drill hole data and all other geotechnical data as well. This workflow approach to generating uh, geotechnical models is easily adoptable. An additional or new data that is added to the model dynamically updates, saving time and ensuring the model is always up to date. Leapfrog provides a unique and user friendly way of modelling fault services considering all data from all data sources to provide the basis of geotechnical risk evaluation through the generation of fault and or geotechnical domains. And if you'd like to hear more about how the workflows are demonstrated in today's webinar can help add value to your projects or organisation, please feel free to get in touch using the contact details shown on the screen for your region. Thanks very much.